the case was basically a challenge to the current policy on the care and management of trans prisoners in England and Wales. Um, and the case um, was brought about by a non-trans woman um, who was saying that the policies infringed upon her human rights um, and basically um, that she shouldn't have to share space with trans women um, with uh, convictions for sexual or violent offenses against women. Now, in the case itself, there's there you'll see if you read the judgment, there's some conflation around whether at the heart of the case was an attempt to exclude all trans women. Mm -hmm. um, and it was sort of clarified um, that it was about trying to exclude trans women with um, sexual or violent offenses against women, but you'll see there's a kind of constant slippage in the judgment, or at least in the in the claimant's arguments that I think really speak to what is at the core of the case, mm -hmm. um, which is actually uh, group-based discrimination against trans people. The, the claimant um, argue that the policies, the policies should be declared unlawful. The outcome of the case um, was that the judge dismissed those claims and said that the policy was not um, unlawful um, and the the policy didn't the policy itself did not violate the rights of women prisoners mm -hmm. um, and so to quote specifically from the decision the court said that the policies quote do not involve an unjustified or disproportionate intrusion with the convention rights of women prisoners and by convention rights the court was referring to the human rights act So um, I intervened, um, I was granted permission to intervene in the court, in the, in the case, and I, I did that on behalf of the Bent Bars Project. Um, and that intervention, actually, the fact that we were granted permission to intervene was significant in itself, um, because inter, intervener status is at the discretion of the court, and the court basically has to recognize that you have some level of expertise or something to contribute. Um, and that was important because I think there are very few organizations like Bent mm -hmm. Bars um, who have been working directly with um, LGBT prisoners, you know, in the capacity that we have been for the last 12 years. Mm -hmm. um, and also the kind of research work that we do and I also do with my academic hat on was, you know, one of the reasons why I think we were granted intervener status. Um, and we, um, we intervened not because we were necessarily taking a position on the case itself, but because we were very concerned that the arguments being used in the case were based on faulty um, statistics, um, kind of false claims and kind of inaccurate and decontextualized um, statistics basically. Mm -hmm. And we were very concerned if those claims were being used to kind of whip up um, stereotypes and and harmful discriminant like basically kind of to to perpetuate harmful and discriminatory mm -hmm. stereotypes against trans people mm -hmm. and our concern was that if those kind of stereotypes were accepted by the court um, then they could have much wider implications because it would reinforce a kind of assumption that trans people are somehow dangerous or more risky or pose a kind of threat um, to non-trans women. And there isn't an evidence base for that. Um, and so we were, that was the basis of our intervention. We may have a bit of a dig digression, but I'll, I'll give an example, which I think is, is potentially relevant. So we saw this happen in another case in the United States where a case around um, sex offenders and kind of uh, inaccurate claims about sex offenders and their re-offense re rates was cited by a, a court decision, and then it got recited by many, many other courts. Mm -hmm. um, and so it turned out to be a completely inaccurate fact. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't true, but it got, because it was written into a legal judgment, it got recited and basically turned into a fact, even though it yeah. wasn't a fact. And then it got used to create very regressive policies mm -hmm. around dealing with sexual 
um, people who have convictions for sexual offenses. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were similarly concerned that something that might happen like that here where you know, the judges aren't gonna be experts around trans prisoners. That's not what their job is. Their job is to adjudicate the law. And so they're not, you know, they might be presented with information that they don't have enough contextual information to understand that that information is faulty. And mm -hmm. so if something similar were written into this case, it could set a, a type of legal fact mm -hmm. that then could be used in many other cases to discriminate against trans people. And that's what we were really concerned about is that kind of discrimination um, and kind of harmful uh, stereotyping that might have lasting implications. And I, th I think also because the power of the kind of sex offender discourse is so, uh, you know, it's almost untouchable. And mm -hmm. this strategy has been very effective in the past around kind of um, that has such a long history of using the trope of the kind of dangerous sexual predator and mm -hmm. attaching it to sexual minority. But it's being reinvoked in the current period to whip up all sorts of um, to make discrimination look as though it's legitimate, mm -hmm. because of course nobody you know nobody is going to condone any kind of sex of offending, mm -hmm. nor should they. So I think part of the reason why it was so important for us to intervene is because the strategy that is being used to kind of whip up transphobia is to attach an association with transness and riskiness or transness and danger. Yeah. Um, and that is not a, that is a very old strategy. Mm. You know, we've seen it many times before um, that you, you say that gay men are pedophiles and therefore need to be kept away from children. Or you say, you know, lesbians are unfit mothers and they shouldn't be able to adopt or, you know, have their own children or whatever. Those are all strategies that we have seen many times before mm. for many years. And we're seeing them being redeployed um, specifically targeting trans people. Mm -hmm. And they be, they're very difficult to counter because, and this is what I think is happening for those of us who are trying to counter it, is you get accused of, you know, being on the side of sex offenders or yeah. being somehow sympathetic mm -hmm. uh, to mm -hmm. sex offenders. And for those of us who have a long history of doing anti-violence work, mm -hmm. you know, I start, first started volunteering at my local rape crisis center when I was 16. Mm -hmm. I have a long history of doing anti-violence work. It is very distressing for people mm. to accuse you of not caring about sexual assault when many of us are motivated and the work that we do is precisely motivated because we want to stop, put an end to sexual violence. Yeah. But these kind of, this, this discriminatory and stereotypical um, assumptions are not what is actually gonna enable us to stop sexual violence. It is part of what enables sexual violence to flourish yeah. because we assume that there are these dangerous others that we can come somehow isolate and we don't look at the pervasiveness of sexual assault yeah. in amongst our communities at large. Because one of the things I also wanted us to talk about is that there hasn't been much discussion about the way in which the prison itself creates the conditions where sexual yeah. violence flourishes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there's been this assumption and you'll see it, it's sort of slightly referenced in the judgment, but it was also referenced mm -hmm. in, um, in the case hearing itself, this assumption that women's prisons are somehow safe spaces mm -hmm. until yeah. trans women enter them. And mm -hmm. that is simply not true. That is absolutely not true. And when you look at the, the stats, you know, non-trans women, so cis women commit sexual assault against other women in prison. Staff mm -hmm. commit sexual assaults against other women in prison. So mm -hmm. if people are really concerned about sexual violence in prison, um, you're missing the target if you're yeah. focusing on trans women. Mm -hmm. And since the policy has come, the revised policy has come into play, there have been no recorded instance, instances of trans women without GRCs sexually assaulting any women. Yet there have been instances of non-trans women um, assaulting other women. Mm -hmm. And also in the men's estate, there have been a number of cases of, of trans women being sexually assaulted by mm -hmm. others in the prison. So we have mm -hmm. trans women who are vulnerable to sexual assault in the men's prison. And that is not, has not been a kind of key focus of discussion mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. this case. And so really, I mean, you know, any act of sexual violence 
in the prison is something that we all should be outraged about. And we should all be saying this is unacceptable and it must be addressed. Mm -hmm. But when we try to say, locate the root of that problem in trans people, that mm -hmm. is where we are missing the fundamental problems that are within the prison and the prison structure itself. Mm -hmm. um, and we do a disservice to every person who is a survivor of sexual assault in the prison system and outside of the prison system when we don't tackle those issues. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And that's really important. I think as well, locate, yeah, as you say, locating the problem in anything else other than the prison structure and the conditions that enable, yeah, as you say, sexual and gendered violence to flourish misses, yeah, misses the mark. Um, and, and I think, systems, yeah, and yeah mean, they, I, they don't help, right? And so. I think one of the, the problems is that like no one is saying that there shouldn't be risk assessments that are done. Now, risk assessment tools are very problematic. They're yeah. applied in all sorts of, you know, problematic ways. Mm -hmm. But I think, again, there's been an assumption that, you know, if you are defending, um, you know, the inclusion of trans women within the women's estate, that somehow you don't have a concern about risk. Mm -hmm. But the policy was not saying that there should be no risk assessment. Mm -hmm. the, the, the point is that that risk shouldn't be sutured to transness. Mm -hmm. And that when you say that risk is associated with someone's um, characteristic, which mm -hmm. is a characteristic that is hugely discriminated against, then that's when you see actually what is at the heart of this is a case, is a question of discrimination mm -hmm. rather than risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's really important. Uh, so that that was a key, another key reason actually why we intervened, because the case was potentially testing the exemptions. Mm. So if the Equality Act says that you can't discriminate. Um, against groups with protected characteristics. Um, the exemptions say there may be certain circumstances mm -hmm. where it is acceptable, where it's a um, proportionate means for achieving a legitimate aim. And what they mean by that is, for example, if women's sexual assault centers, normally you couldn't say oh, we're just providing a service to women only because that would be sex discrimination. Mm -hmm. But obviously that is a very important service to provide to women. Um, that needs to be, you know, specific to women. Um, and so, but what was being tested here was whether those exemptions would then be used to exclude trans women. Mm -hmm. And that um, would have much bigger implications mm -hmm. than just the prison policy, but could have wider implications for trans inclusive organizations that provide support, for mm -hmm. example, around sexual assault for trans women um, or gender nonconforming people. So, this was really important because in the case they were trying to sort of argue that the exemption should have been used and that if they're not used that's a violation of someone's rights yeah. and actually what the judge said was that those exemptions are discretionary and you're not obliged yeah. to use them and that is really important again for trans inclusive organizations particularly around sexual assault um, because you know rates of sexual assault against um, trans and gender nonconforming people are very high. Mm -hmm. And if trans people are excluded from accessing those services, that is, you know, really neglecting a very mm -hmm. acute need. Mm. Okay, then. So if we think about, um, we've broken some of the, the, the main parts of the decision down, we can maybe go back to that in a, in a minute. Um, how, yeah, how do you see this decision now as impacting on the wider kind of communities and also potentially in the media as well? We can maybe take them one at a time, those questions. Mm -hmm. So I think in terms of um, like in the legal domain, I think this case does um, make a big impact for mm -hmm. trans and gender non-conforming people and non-binary people because for two reasons. I would say, A, it is pushed back against this notion that you can allow one group to discriminate against another group um, on the basis of transness. And I mm -hmm. think that's really important, whether we're talking about prison policy or whether we're talking about other policies. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think the issue around the exemptions is really important because if the case had lost and an argument had been made that you were basically required to enact those exemptions around trans people, then that would have been 
very that would have had a huge impact again on trans inclusive services so lots of um, fantastic women's organizations are very trans inclusive and provide great services to trans people um, and that would have made it much more difficult for them to mm -hmm. do that because they would have had to justify why they weren't using the exemptions mm -hmm. so from a legal point of view i mean i do think we will probably the the exemptions will continue to get tested because i think the kind of gender critical strategy is to use the law to kind of deploy it in a way to keep testing. And I mm -hmm. think there are elements of that that haven't, you know, that aren't clear. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we'll see further challenges, but for now it sets a kind of, it does set a sort of precedent that says, actually you are not obliged to use those exemptions and being trans inclusive is not out of step with the Equality Act and the spirit of the Equality Act. And I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of whether this case has, I think the negative sides of this case has a lot to do with the media, because I think the media has already, I mean, it's only been a few days, but the way in which the media has already taken up this case, I think has furthered a lot of very problematic kind of narratives mm -hmm. that are very harmful for trans and gender nonconforming people on the ground in terms of reiterating this kind of false notion that trans rights and women's rights are in conflict. I mean, the mm -hmm. framing of that already assumes that trans, you know, women are not women and that's very mm -hmm. problematic, mm -hmm. but it also assumes that things like sexual violence and the roots of sexual violence do not, are not connected in terms of the violence that trans women experience and gender mm -hmm. non-conforming people experience and the, the violence that non-trans um, women or other people experience. Mm -hmm. So I think, I do worry a lot about how the story that is being told about this case will continue to um, replicate some of the harmful narratives that are making it very difficult for mm -hmm. trans people to live their lives and for gender nonconforming people to live their lives in the everyday. Mm -hmm. um, because the, the way in which the case is being talked about, I think is reiterating and relying again on misuse of kind of statistics. Um, to suggest that trans people, you know, pose risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, to, to give an example of that, The Guardian, when it first issued its, its um, news coverage of this case on Friday, mis, uh, incorrectly stated the facts and mm -hmm. said that all trans women in the women's estate have convictions for sexual offenses. And that simply is not true. It is absolutely not true. Um, now in fairness to the Guardian, they corrected it um, when I flagged it with them. Um, but it, I think it speaks to something that it didn't occur to someone that that might be a fact that needed to be yeah. checked. You know, this presumption that, tr that there is a kind of inherent danger that's mm -hmm. or inherent risk that's associated with trans people and trans women in particular. Because I think we also need to talk about the fact that this is very focused on trans yeah. women, trans men and non-binary people are often excluded from the conversation and mm -hmm. also gender non-conforming women. So women who identify as women um, but are gender non-conforming who get read in particular ways mm -hmm. that are also deemed to be threatening. Um, mm -hmm. So again, I think it's kind of false to think about this case as just about, you know, yeah. its impact on trans people. I think it has an impact uh, on gender in much broader ways. And I, I think it's, I mean, in fairness, the stats and the data are very hard to read in mm -hmm. lots of ways. They're confusing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Different stats are measuring different things and people conflate them and get them confused. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can, I do understand why people might sometimes get the stats wrong. But mm -hmm. one of the really important things is the statistics need to be contextualized in order to understand them. Exactly. Um, and so for that reason, I would really urge people to read the bent bars trans prisoner info sheets because we have frequently asked questions that kind of breaks that down and explains why the data that that is currently circulating is not reliable um, and shouldn't be you know used as a kind of claim around any kind of statistical risk mm -hmm. um, because the evidence just isn't there to support that um, and so I can give you an example of that you know this the stat that circulates all the time is that 50 percent of trans people in prison have sex offenses or in for sex offenses. Mm -hmm. But that 50% number is dependent on the overall number of trans people that are recognized in the system. Mm 
Mm -hmm. um, and the ways in which the, the number of trans people in the system is there are huge discrepancies in terms of who is counted um, as trans within the system and who is not. And so just to give you an example, and I'm just going to pull up my stats to make sure that I've got the actual numbers right. Okay. So in the judgment, it refers to 74 um, out of 129 trans people in the male estate have convictions for one or more sexual offenses. Yeah. That sounds like a lot, right? So if it's 74 out of the total, which is 163, mm -hmm. 74 out of 163 is 45%. So that does mm -hmm. seem very high. Mm -hmm. But in approximately the same period in which those figures were counted, the prison inspectorate also did a survey and asked prisoners to self-identify whether they identify mm -hmm. as trans. And if you look at their numbers, their numbers suggest that there could be as many as 1,600 people in the prison. So 1,600. Yeah. Now, if you take 74 out of 1,600, yeah. that's 4%. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about a range of numbers that are between 4% or 45%. Right. Yeah. And that's that's yeah. actually or 57 percent if you do it of the smaller number. But that's either way, that's a huge range. And it's it's just not reliable. Now, mm -hmm. of course, some of those in that uh, additional 1600, some of them could also be in for sexual offenses. And no one is trying to say that there are no trans people that are in for sex offenses. Mm -hmm. But what but the way in which the stats are being presented is very misleading. Mm -hmm. um, and also the other thing that we need to bear in mind is that the stats of people who are convicted are not the same as the people who are committing offenses, right? Because we know that the system is very selective. So rates of criminalization are not the same as rates of offending, yeah. right? And so this is speculative because we didn't keep data on this, but I'm, I would be, would be, would bet money on the fact that if you looked at the population of gay men who were in prison in the 70s, in the 80s, or the 90s, you would also find that a high percentage of them were in for sexual offenses. Mm -hmm. Now, is that because gay men are more likely to commit sexual offenses? No, there is no evidence that gay men are more likely to, in fact, you know, heterosexual men are, are predominantly the ones who commit sexual offenses. Mm -hmm. um, and yet those numbers were misleading because men, gay men were targeted for sexual offenses, not because they were more prone to convict, uh, to more commode, sorry, not that they were more prone to, to committing those offenses, but they were more likely to be targeted for those offenses. So again, mm -hmm. that's not saying that the ones who were targeted necessarily didn't commit them, but it's saying there's a lot of bias in the system and discrimination in the system. And you need to recognize that when you're looking at the statistics overall, otherwise you get a very faulty picture. For sure. And that context here is so important given how sensitive this issue already is. Um, yeah. yeah, and statistics kind of belie, I can, I think, so sometimes statistics can belie that kind of complexity that we have here. Yeah, and yeah. so you're seeing those, those kind of bare stats mm -hmm. being peddled out in the media, um, but, they're, but with none of the contextual information. Mm -hmm. And the ministry has said repeatedly that they recognize that there's selection bias in the collection of that stat because the only people who are collected or the only people who are counted in those stats are people who have had a, a case board, a trans case board. Yeah. And if you're in for a, a higher, a, a more significant offense, you're more likely to have a case board than if you're someone who's in for a short offense. Yeah. So there's already built in kind of bias into those numbers. And a further issue is that those numbers aren't actually based on prisoners self-reporting, it's based on staff. It's staff that fill those out. So it's staff um, making you know, assertions about people's identity. And, mm -hmm. and I'm sure the staff are you know, doing the best that they can, but there's lots of reasons why yeah. people are not gonna disclose their trans identity to, to prison yeah. staff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the numbers, I mean, I guess if there's a message I wanna put out there, it's that the numbers are not what they seem and people should um, think about the context and, and really try to not take some of these numbers at face value because they're really misleading. This is really important stuff. I'm glad that we're speaking about this for sure. Maybe we can speak a little bit then about what we were talking a little bit before we started talking uh, on this about
the kind of the trajectory so thinking about you know the evolution the development of this so with trans Tara you know Tara Hudson these kind of cases Vicky Thompson Joanne Latham mm. yeah, yeah so I'm glad that you've brought that up um because I think that's another thing that isn't being talked about so there's a kind of attack of the policy itself um mm. by people who are hostile to trans rights um but people are kind of forgetting that that policy was revised because we had a number of trans women die in the male mm -hmm. estate. And that was because at that time, it was very hard to be moved um, from the male estate into the female estate if you didn't have a gender recognition certificate. And yet very few trans people have gender recognition certificates because of all the barriers that there yeah. are to get them. Um, and so it was the risk of violence of sexual assault, you know, for example, in Tara Hudson's case, it was the risk of suicide, these very material risks that trans women in particular, but trans people in general were facing in the prison was what motivated the policy. And yet we've had very little discussion about that around this case. There's much more focus on non-trans women's fear of trans people um, yeah. rather than the actual outcome. Um, and of course, people have used, you know, the Karen White case, or they pick a kind of individual case, and they try to use that um, as an to kind of bolster the arguments um, that say that, you know, people should be very fearful mm. of trans people in particular. But I think we again need to really think about, I mean, people have very valid reasons for being afraid of sexual assault in prison. Um, and we, again, we should be talking about that, mm -hmm. and, and recognizing where that fear comes from, and why that fear needs to be addressed, mm -hmm. but we cannot continue to attach that fear to transness. That mm -hmm. is, uh, that's what discrimination is. I mean, being fearful or discriminatory mm -hmm. towards a particular group, you know, you can acknowledge that people have a fear, but that doesn't mean that that fear should result in people being discriminated against. No, that's exactly the point. For sure. And I think that fear can then be used to maybe mobilize, as we talked about before, getting right down to the structures in the first instance and looking at why we use things like the prison to resolve a whole heap of harms and conflict, right? And yeah. not using other means to do that. Yeah. And I think there's also been a real, you know, misuse of uh, d deployment around trauma, which I find very troubling. Mm -hmm. So this kind of, you know, in the court case, again, we heard that the mere presence of a trans woman in the women's estate is is assumed to be triggering and harmful and distressing mm -hmm. but when pushed on why that would be distressing it was always because you know trans women might be perceived to be men or they mm -hmm. might be perceived to be masculine and that might be threatening but we don't see a conversation from the same people saying well a large portion of staff in the women's prison are men. And mm -hmm. so if the presence of men is very traumatizing or the presence of someone that is perceived to be male is very traumatizing, where is the campaign to say that all staff in women's prison should be women? You know, mm -hmm. and I think the fact that there isn't such a campaign really signals that actually this isn't about the trauma associated with maleness or masculinity, yeah. but it is about transphobia. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, that's not to say that some people don't have a fear or people don't have trauma. Absolutely. People mm -hmm. do have lots of different kinds of trauma. But when, again, it's like trauma manifests itself in very different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and to assume, you know, if that's, if that's the kind of argument, it's like that is the same argument that would say, well, we shouldn't allow butch lesbians in you know, women's prisons either because they might, you know, they might resemble men or they might look too masculine and they might be triggering. Um, and there's also a, a kind of denial of the fact that there are lots of um, non-trans women in the women's estate that welcome trans women and have been very supportive. You know, mm -hmm. so Bent Bars has received letters from trans women. You know, we had one letter from a trans woman who was held in segregation for a long time in the men's estate, was finally trans transferred over to the women's estate, was very nervous about that. And she described to us how the women kind of took her under their wing, how they gave her a makeover. They did all this stuff to be very supportive and very inclusive, but we don't hear about that in the media either. Mm. There's a kind of assumption that all yeah. non-trans women are afraid of trans women or that they don't want to share space with them. 
Yeah. And that's just not true. Certainly there are some, yeah. you know, but there are lots of people who hold discriminatory attitudes about a whole range of people. And that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that our policy should reinforce that discrimination. What we should be doing is supporting people to better understand that discrimination in order to um, shift those discriminatory attitudes. Cool. Okay, so I think we spoke a little bit before about um, how cis women and trans women are pitted against each other. And you gave some really good examples actually as to how solidarity is not really heard or um, seen in the mainstream, even though it, it exists and it's materially happening. So could you speak a little bit more about that and maybe how, how yeah, where we go from here from this case um, and how we might see solidarity in the longer in the longer run yeah so i think i mean one of the things that i do find disheartening is the way in which the media is constantly ignoring the kind of long history that trans feminists for example have contributed to yeah. feminist movements and feminist anti-violence work and to mm -hmm. work against state violence mm -hmm. you know those contributions have been really important and also the kind of long-standing solidarities across you know, queer feminists and trans communities. And that's not to say that there haven't been fraught instances yeah. um, for sure, but I think the kind of emphasis on this division really erases a lot of really important history and a lot of work that is being done um, to build stronger solidarities mm -hmm. and to build solidarities across, you know, race and class and sexuality and disability and not to kind of have this notion of a kind of singular, mm -hmm. uh, woman or a kind of singular category that doesn't recognize the way in which systems of oppression harm all of us yeah. and we all have a stake in challenging those systems and resisting those systems and we will only be successful in doing that if we work together and so solidarity politics are absolutely crucial and we do not want prisoners to be used as a kind of wedge in order to kind of like you know increase divisions what we need to be doing is is working you know, across the beautiful differences in our community um, and the vibrance that brings to our communities and the strengths that that brings to our community. Um, because group-based stereotypes and stigmatization is never going to reduce violence in our communities, we need to be addressing the underlying causes of violence and that's about inequality and discrimination and we all have a stake in addressing that. Mm -hmm. um, so I really, I hope that some of the conversation shifts and rather than this kind of focus on division, there's a focus on what we all need to be doing together to work towards ending violence in our communities, ending violence in the prisons, ending violence outside of the prisons. You know, we need to be um, working on campaigns. Also, if we're really concerned about women's well-being in prison, we need to get women out of prison. Yeah, you know, exactly. that's the easiest way to protect people from violence is to get people out of those circumstances and to address the problems that the social problems that we're using prisons to address are much better addressed through housing, through healthcare, through employment, through poverty reduction, through anti discrimination efforts. There's many things that we could be doing as part of an anti violence strategy, and we should be working on that much more than kind of focusing on these kind of false divisions or, mm. you know, creating false stereotypes about where danger is located. Yeah, so important. I think it goes back a little bit um, to Lola Olafemi's book. We've spoken a lot about her book in very, you know, various ways this year and before, but we can't have a feminism that thrives basically on other people's lives being unlivable or, um, or yeah. So yeah, I think what you have to say is really important. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And I think, you know, also, the, the kind of learning from the ways in which when we have failed, you know, when white feminists have failed mm -hmm. to do right on race politics, that has harmed all women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's disproportionately harmed women of color, but we, you know, have needed to learn and continually to learn from those mistakes. And we need to continually learn that imply those lessons in terms of how we build our solidarity politics going forward. And so I think mm -hmm. um, it's really important to, again, foreground what it means, ask the question of what it means to act in solidarity. And that's a lesson that we have to learn over and over and continue to do. Um, and I would really encourage people to have a look at the Bent Bars um, trans prisoner info sheets, including speaking of solidarity, the 
The first one is about um, general info about experiences of trans, um, non-binary and gender non-conforming people in prison. The second is about frequently asked questions. But the third one is a solidarity, what you can do, things you can do to support um, trans people in prison and gender non-conforming people in prison, but also part of the solidarity efforts are looking to these broader structures and challenging, again, yeah. those structural issues that are feeding and fostering violence and inequality. And that's really where we need to direct our efforts. This yeah. is such a hopeful ending to this conversation. It's really important. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm sure these conversations will keep keep a pace right because it's not going to go away after this one unfortunately but um i really appreciate your time lambo we both do um for giving us some space to talk about yeah a whole heap of issues which we've not been able to talk about um in relation to the case and beyond so thank you so much thanks again for having me and also just yeah we definitely need to continue the conversations in many different spheres so yeah, yeah hopefully there will be many more